Okay. Um, I'm going to give you a, a quick insight into my um, into my past, um, a bit more about the present, and possibly a little bit about the future, if we have enough time. So she's kind of spoilt the whole lot by telling my story. I was going to do that. So th this is um, me, aged 17. I had no intention of being a designer. I was much more interested in disco music. I spent two years as a professional musician, and um, I had a, a, a terrible motorcycle accident, which stopped, my, stopped me touring um, with the band, and so that was the end of that. Um, but I'd already started um, <clears throat> a hobby, and that was making, um, making things. And I'm showing you this really rather ugly chair for a specific reason, because for me it's kind of proof that anybody could be a designer. Um, the most important thing is, is practice. So, so here we have a very ugly chair, a very probably dangerous chair. Uh, it's um, rusty, um, but the good thing about it is that it's got... Um, a very specifically personal attitude. And I think, in a way, that's the most important thing that a designer could have, is um, uh, a uniqueness. And more and more in the modern world, that's the thing um, that allows you to stick out. So I'm embarrassed by this chair, but what it was was um, significant because it's um, made with free materials, it's made with no skills, it's made... Um, with no tools either, it's just my bare hands, um, and it has um, a very Tom Dixon aesthetic, right? So I get, um, wh what allowed me to become a designer was, was uh, my, my secret superpower, which was learning how to weld. And so welding's an amazing technique for people that are impatient like me because um, it allows you to very quickly make structures that are strong uh, and substantial, and it allowed me really to make many, many objects in my first year or two of, of, of practicing as a, uh, well, I wasn't even a designer there, I was somebody that was making things for, mainly for fun, and then increasingly for profit. Um, so <clears throat> this is maybe uh, a year later, so you can see I've become really practical already. This is an office chair, um, it rotates, <laughs> and um, you can see that the uh, forms are, are, are really uh, uh, also based mainly on, on the found object. So the intrinsic decoration inside the um, uh, drain covers and, and the bits of Victoriana um, provided decoration. So um, I then skip forward a couple of years. I'm no longer making things out of scrap. I'm going to Chinese cooking shops and buying pots and pans and ladles. And my, my welding skills have increased. You can see the, there's a degree of comfort creeping in. And um, I'm making multiples now because I can buy several of these pieces. They're still found objects, but they're bought from uh, plumbing shops, from bicycle shops. Uh, here you've got a frying pan as a seat, a ladle, bicycle forks as, as, as legs. Um, so I'm becoming increasingly sophisticated. My welding's getting better. It's becoming safer and more um, formal in its, uh, in its construction. And this is an attempt at the um, lightest chair in metal uh, in the world, um, Guinness Book of Records kind of thing. And um, so, so you can see there's more form creeping in. Uh, and this is really through just making many, many things. Um, I think, you know, if I'd been to um, art school, probably a lot of this creativity would have been squeezed out of me. Um, I would have only made, you know, to uh, a, a brief from the tutor. I'd have probably only made three or four objects in, in my year at college. But here, um, with nobody looking on, all on my own, I was able to create an aesthetic which was uh, uh, uniquely mine. Um, you can see that the things are affected partly also by the tools I buy in the workshop. So this is, you know, the week that I buy a, a guillotine for chopping strips of metal. Everything suddenly turns into strips of metal. So the aesthetic is often driven by the um, manufacturing technique as well as the material, um, rather than by a, 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 an exterior brief or, or a specific style. So you'll see that recurring throughout the, the, the work um, over, over the years, really. So, you know, I was very fortunate to, to grow up in London at a time um, when, when there was a, a lot of uh, tribes, a lot of, um, a lot of freedom. What was great about the, the, the punk uh, movement, although I was never a punk, I promise I really wasn't, I was, I was more into to this disco music, um, but it gave you a sense of 
um, a sense of freedom to, to have your own attitude, I think, is, is what was going on in London. And um, it also taught you that, that really, even with very few skills, you, you could make a success out of almost anything. So um, I, I've got a big debt to pay to the London of the time, which was full of, um, of, of creativity, all done at low cost. Um, I often think of design as a kind of a form of alchemy. And you can see what I'm doing here is really pretty much turning uh, rubbish into gold. And I think that's really the power of design um, to, to, to really um, turn base materials into something precious. Um, and I continue doing that, and you know, maybe fast forward another five years, I'm making attempts at industrial production, um, this time using the metal workshop that I'd created uh, to make the molds rather than to make the objects, and then sending them out to a, a rotational molding factory that specialized in traffic cones. And this is my first attempt at industrial production. And um, by then, I'd grown to a, a size where I had maybe 17 lads working in a, in a metal workshop in, in South London. I had a small retail shop. I had, um, I had a plastics business. And it, it was all looking a bit shaky. Um, so it was really time to um, start looking at other avenues. Now, I'd been making these chairs. And you can see, again, that they're becoming slightly more um, sophisticated, maybe not in surface, but definitely in shape. This was a very comfortable chair I made uh, using the, the steering wheel from a, a, a Volkswagen Golf and the inner tube from the same car wrapped around. Um, really a, a commercial disaster, not because it wasn't comfortable, um, but because it still smelled really of burnt rubber. Now, the UK at the time was a place where design as a profession didn't really exist a great deal. Uh, there was no support system from industry. I know young designers in Canada complain about the same thing. And all over the world, people complain about the lack of support from industry or government and the rest of it. But London in, in the, in the um, late 80s was really uh, a design desert. No design museum, no design publications. Um, and Italy was like the golden... Uh, the golden country for design. You know, for, for, for many years since um, the 50s, um, the Italians had understood the power of design to, as a transformative force for industry and for commerce. And they had this uh, amazing capacity to, to improve on design. So you can see the, the, um, the chair, the previous chair, the rubber chair, um, now polished and, and, uh, and honed by the uh, craftsmen of, Indo of, of Italy. Um, this time by a company called Capellini. Um, there's also a great proximity between the design center of Milan and some of the, the, the furniture industries in, in um, Treviso and Venice and, and in, the, um, in, in the direct area of Milan, which allows people to develop things really quickly. So you can see here a much more sophisticated chair, uh, a much more commercial chair, and um, uh, it's, it's probably lost quite a lot of the British character in the process, which was a bit of a shame. And um, you know, I made the mistake of, of selling those designs to the, um, uh, to the Italian manufacturing companies, uh, leaving me with very little things to sell myself in my own studio. Um, and so that wasn't really a, a sustainable um, business model for me. But I'll always um, be very thankful to the Italians, not for the very poor royalties that I got, but for the international um, profile that it gave me and, and, and a real understanding of, of what it was to be a designer rather than a kind of a really bad welder, if you like. So um, thanks to Italy. But I think um, what happened there was uh, the, the whole organization I was creating was looking increasingly shaky. I was an untrained uh, retailer, an untrained designer, untrained uh, factory manager, and um, it really was time to get a proper job. And so I was very lucky that my first job um, was jumping from uh, a tiny self-producer to um, the biggest furniture company in the world group. So uh, IKEA owns Habitat, and I was the creative director of Habitat for maybe 10 years. So I stopped altogether designing and, uh, in favor of uh, creative direction, which is a very different um, skill set, a very different attitude. When you're a designer, you're obsessed with a single object. When you're a creative director, you've got to kind of ignore that and try and mold huge uh, amounts of different typologies and, and, and different um, uh, forces into, into one singular vision. So this was, uh, uh, for me, the, the, the university of, of uh, 
of our business. You know, I didn't learn huge amounts about design whilst I was doing this, but I learned vast amounts about logistics, about international sourcing, about communication, about marketing, about branding, um, and certainly about retail, which uh, I, I would never have been exposed to if I was just um, designing for um, the Italian companies or, or, or self-producing. So it's given me absolutely no depth at all. You can see how shallow I am, but immense breadth of, of knowledge about all of the other things in, in, in the design business that you can affect as a designer um, to ensure the success or not of a product. Um, and um, after, after 10 years of corporate life, enough was enough, and it was time to um, create my own brand. And just like Canadian cowboys, I think a brand is, is something that, that is more a stamp of ownership rather than um, the way that branding is used very loosely as a term these days. And it's something which uh, I'm immensely lucky to have a super snappy name with an X in the middle that I can stamp into things and really give ownership to. Um, I always worry for people like Konstantin Gercic and, and names that are more confusing um, that it's difficult for them to get the recognition. So I, I, th I thank my parents for giving me this name. It really is mine. It's not made up and um, good for branding. Now, the reason I wanted to do it differently this time around and create my own, my own label under my own name is because I think that the nature of the furniture business is um, very... Um, much in favor of the manufacturer. So this is a great company, this is Vitra. And you all know Vitra, the amazing Swiss manufacturer of uh, mainly uh, office um, systems. Uh, but they also have this amazing selection of design objects um, from a huge variety of amazing designers um, who range from the current geniuses like Jasper Morrison and, and Konstantin Gercic, um, Ron Arad, um, to the dead heroes of yesteryear, like Werner Panton, um, like the Eameses. And so it's a fantastic firm to be associated with, and it's fantastic to be um, taken up by one of these big companies. But I think for the individual designer, and, or the young upcoming designer, it's a disaster. Uh, because what you're doing is you're competing with all of the classics and everybody else. Um, without really knowing when your stuff is going to be coming out. So this is even worse when you get to Herman Miller. The designer is competing against maybe 60 other designers. So you have no control over your own destiny, in a way. Um, you don't know when the things are going to come out. You don't know what other objects are going to come out at the same time. And you're competing against uh, Charles and Ray Eames at the same time, right? Um, so it makes it a very, a very difficult backdrop um, to control your own destiny. So that's why I did try to do it differently. Now, having your own label is a common, um, a common way to exist in, um, in the fashion business, uh, for instance, but very, very few product designers take that plunge and leap into creating their own brands. Now, there's reasons for that. It's much more difficult than I thought. Um, but what it does do is to allow you to be master of your own destiny. So, you know, whether it's the way that you present things under your, under your umbrella, so this is our studio, um, in London, which has a showroom, it has a, a, a restaurant as well, so you can kind of live um, the whole um, concept and you're all welcome because it's open to the public next time in London. Whether you decide that fluorescent orange is the color of the day and that you paint everything one color, um, which I can't actually recommend because it's a commercial disaster, uh, or whether you want to bring your little dog into work, um, it's much better having your own brand if you're a designer. But it does come with a series of quite complex challenges. Um, so our brand kind of specializes in, in objects which are of a very um, substantial materiality and reasonably simple shapes. I like to kind of call it expressive minimalism. Um, and, and the idea here is really to, to try and produce objects that will last for a, a long time, you know, beyond a kind of fashion cycle. So you can see here two kilos of glass in the lamp. Um, the lamp is dishwasher proof, so you can take it off and stick it in your dishwasher. And the objective is really to use some of these um, vaguely recognizable forms to, to produce objects which are intemporal, if you like, and will work in many different contexts, whether that's uh, an industrial space or a, a highly decorated space. So these are some glass lamps. Um, and lighting's been a very good field for us because it's a kind of extraordinary, extraordinarily... Um, 
uh, active field in technology, obviously with the new light sources, um, with the new regulations that are coming in from government. Um, it's a great place to work as a designer because uh, you want to be where the, there is a cutting edge of technology. Um, but it's also a, a great um, uh, place to be contemporary as well because I think increasingly people are quite conservative about the sofas that they, they buy or the tables for very good reason because um, you, these things stick around for 20, 20 or 30 years. Um, people are looking more and more at lighting as something which is part of the modern world, something where they're prepared to be, take a bit more of a risk. You know, if I was making an analogy with a fashion company, it'd be the handbag of the, uh, of, of the furnishing world. You can see here uh, what impact it also has on a, on a whole space. So we specialized a lot in pendant lighting of all sorts, you know, some decorative ones, a lot of geometry here, a lot of metals. Uh, a lot of surface finishes, so this iridescent finish um, created um, by using uh, a real gold uh, glaze. Um, and a lot of shadow play and, and, and ideas about trying to uh, make objects that affect uh, or impact the whole room rather than just being uh, a, a decorative centerpiece. So you can see here, for instance, these lamps are not only do they, they illuminate, but they also create whole effects like this. Um, completely free carpet that I've created for the customer of the lamp here, or, or the free wallpaper that comes from this one here. And really to try and break up some of the harsh lighting and give it a more natural feel once it's um, uh, uh, in, in a space. Um, so, yeah, we do a lot of clusters, big clusters that kind of, you know, replace the, 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 the traditional chandelier. Sometimes they're abstract, sometimes they're very um, formal like this. Um, we're working a lot on, on not just decorative lighting, but also um, things that really properly illuminate. So this is a lamp made out of um, 32 Fresnel lenses that allow, um, that really uh, pump out the light in all directions and maximize the output from a light bulb. Um, this is a new lamp from last year, which has uh, been our most successful launch ever, which is a, a, a lamp that looks like it's made from handmade glass, but it's actually a, 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 a blow molding um, using also the, the high-tech vacuum metallization that you see a lot on, on um, say, sunglasses, uh, which is a semi-transparent metallization uh, where the metal is only two microns thick, which allows for this internal reflection to build, um, to build up. You can see those on the Caesar stone stand, by the way. Um, so that's called Melt, and it's, um, it's, um, it's the one that you should all be specifying right now whilst it's hot, right? Um, we do more and more furniture as well, and the furniture, uh, uh, of course, allows us to, to really complete whole spaces, um, whether those are more traditional forms of upholstery or, or some of the, um, some of the um, typologies that I was working on when I first started welding. And we're working more and more um, on these really quite sculptural um, but reduced shapes that really make an impact in the room. And more recently, we've been working a lot more into, um, into accessories as well, which is, has provided us huge amounts of uh, adventures um, in all kinds of things like food preparation, um, perfume, and lots of new worlds. And, and this is really affected partly by owning the restaurant back at the studio where we haven't been able to find the, 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 the serveware or the preparation stuff that, that we like to use. And, and you'll see more and more of these accessories, which also give us a completely different clientele because not everybody has got um, a, a, a room for a pendant line or, or the budget for it. it gives us adventures in, in, in tea ceremonies, for instance, or for you Americans that prefer coffee, coffee as well. So these are, these are some of the new accessories we're doing. And, and, and of course, you know, designing also through your nose. I'm more and more interested as we do more and more interior design in the kind of intangibles in a space. Not so much um, the shape or the color of things, but also you know, the smell or, or the sound of things in, in a space. And all too often, you know, interior designers kind of forget about that. So you know, I started thinking about the intangibles when I was thinking about luminosity and how difficult it is to, um, to really think through how something is illuminated um, at different times of the day. But then I think just as important is what you hear in a space, particularly in restaurants, for instance, or, or the smell of a place that can always leave you with a bad memory of a place if you haven't thought through the smell as well. So smells are good. And here's a few projects that we've been doing, which are mainly, um, <coughs> so this is a, a residential conversion in, in East London. 
this is a, a workspace for McCann Erickson, who are obviously the, the, the people from Mad Men. So this is a kind of, it looks like a diner, but it's a new kind of co-working space for them in, in Fifth Avenue in, in Manhattan. Um, here at a, a, a barbecue restaurant with Jamie Oliver, the celebrity British chef. Um, and uh, a, a big hotel that we completed last year in London for Morgan's, uh, the Mondrian London, which was uh, based very much on a kind of nautical theme. Um, and this is really um, uh, the memory of a, of a ship's hull, um, which is a huge wraparound reception desk that goes all the way around to the, the, um, the, the, the restaurant at the back. Hotel is a great typology because it allows you to play not only in giant lobbies, but in smaller domestic spaces like hotel rooms or, or more intimate places like spas, um, bars, even cinemas. And it's like creating a whole village, really. But it's, it's certainly given us a, an opportunity of also testing out our, our products or even creating new products in spaces. And I think that balance of having a product company and an interior design company is also quite unusual and also gives us a laboratory for, for new typologies of objects and also understanding what people really need. This is um, uh, the, maybe the most recent project, which is a, a speakeasy illegal cocktail bar in Atlanta, Georgia, called Himitsu. And then more recently, I've, I'm, I'm starting to dabble in architecture, not satisfied with being a self-taught self musician or self-taught kind of designer or retailer. I'm now a self-taught architect, which is great because it's seven years to learn how to be a proper architect, right? So it's kind of nice to be able to practice in, in a completely different scale. And this is a house in Monaco that I built for a private client. And, and you can see it's still the same kind of interest in, in kind of very simple forms in, in a good proportion with, with quite a, a strong materiality. Um, so although it's a completely different um, trade, it's a very complex trade, it still has the same origins as the, as, as the rest of the design that we do. I thought I'd tell you quickly a, a few stories about the generation of some of these designs. This is one of our most successful lamps called the Beat Lamp. And the origins of this lamp are, are in a kind of non-for-profit um, project that I did in India, trying to save um, the, the vanishing skills of the metal workers in Jaipur. So they make these beautiful pots that they've been making for generations, which are kind of uh, amazing, but, and, and are used mainly in the villages to hold water or to carry water. And the shapes are, are, are fantastic, and the skills are extraordinary, but they're, they're being rapidly lost as, as these are being substituted for much cheaper plastic equivalents uh, that are coming in from, um, from all over Asia. And, and so the loss of skills is, is, is very fast and, and very severe for some of these metal craftsmen. So what we did was just to repurpose the shapes and, and, and create them as, as, as lamps rather than pots. And we've, we've managed to, you know, we're employing something in the region of 40 metal workers, skilled metal workers in, in a different city now, and, and, and they're, they're banging away making these lamps, which is great. And you see um, the range expanding, and you'll see the lamps all over eBay, which is fantastic. 20 pages of Tom Dixon lamps. Unfortunately, all of them um, fakes from Hong Kong or from China. So not a single one of these pages has got an authentic um, Tom Dixon lamp. And that's become more and more of a problem for us, so that the speed of, at which people can copy is kind of extraordinary. And um, we're, we're more and more under attack. Um, even when you go to India and you go to a lighting shop in Delhi, you'll find a cheap Chinese um, import rather than even a, an Indian copy of my Indian lamps, which is kind of ironic and sad in a way. Anyway, so it means that, you know, as a, as a brand, as a designer, you've got to be more nimble, you've got to be faster and, and cleverer about what you do. So, yeah, that's the Chinese ones. And that's the Chinese eBay, Tibao. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm um, practicing a few kind of um, exercise in trying to get really fast to market. You know, the, the, the way that the, the business runs is, is very inelegant and old-fashioned compared particularly to tech companies. You know, we, 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 we would normally design something, wait for an industrialist to come along and invest in something, probably make a chair in a, in a lower-cost economy in Asia, lower-wage economy, um, and then ship it right across the world to Toronto, sit it in a warehouse, and then put it in a design shop, and then hope that one day a customer would buy it. So, 
rather than do that, I thought, well, why not be a bit more modern? Why, why not be like Google and give everything away? Now, I have to say, we're not giving away everything today. So do not go to our gift shop at the back and take it. It's not free today, right? But for this project, what we did do was to, um, was to try and mimic the Google and, and give things away free um, on the basis that um, uh, we were selling advertising on the chair. So the project is you know, a thousand chairs on Trafalgar Square uh, in the middle of London, and the objects made in, in, the, in the UK just ship down direct from the factory to the distribution point, and, um, and then a queue forms, and then suddenly it's chaos. So I managed to get rid of a thousand chairs in six minutes, and you can see the greed um, on people's eyes. You can see people grabbing two chairs instead of one. You can see people trying to stick the chair on top of their child um, to get it away, or, or wearing the chair as a hat as they escape the space. And um, yeah, so, so really, you know, like a Formula One car, like a, um, like a, a Google, you're, you're, or even a Hewlett Packard, you know, giving away something and getting somebody else to pay for it was, it was the objective. Of course, I felt very stupid um, the next week when on eBay, the chair started appearing and reached 200 pounds, you know, three, 400 Canadian dollars uh, online, which meant that I could have been rich. Um, but I wasn't. So another failed project. If there's anybody in industry here that wants to repeat it in Canada, come and speak to me afterwards. So um, you know that you're going to lose your jobs to robots coming up soon, right? All of us are going to. But there's a small, um, uh, a small uh, window of opportunity for designers and brands to exploit the robots before they start exploiting us, really. And that's uh, another little experiment I was doing in, in Milan at the Furniture Fair, which was try, just like I was at the beginning, to define an object by the manufacturing technique. So everybody's obsessed these days with rapid prototyping, um, which is a, an interesting thing but it's all plastic, very expensive plastic. I'm much more interested in the flexibility of some of the machine tools that are used in the car industry. So you, you get these immensely versatile machines uh, called press punch, um, yeah, rolling press punches that have many tools in them. They're very miniaturized, and you can send files to them pretty much from your computer and make lots and lots of things. So this was an exercise in designing a chair to suit the machine and to take the machine to the public and make, make it in front of the public. So I, I bring the machine to the Milan Furniture Fair, um, and I start making a whole restaurant, 200 chairs and lamps and everything. There I am looking very happy with myself because I've produced my first um, uh, on-site chair in the train station in the Science Museum of Milan. And I'm looking, um, yep, so I'm looking even smugger now because I, I'm now making um, these lamps with the same machine and now I'm in the New York um, uh, Furniture Fair, the ICFF, with the same machine, um, which I haven't transported. It's an American machine now. Uh, all I'm doing is sending the file from London. And so I've got this lamp which is also um, parametrically modelable so that you can also make different patterns, for instance. Or you can make a, a two meter uh, diameter um, lamp with the same machine. Um, and you can customize um, the surface to suit your customer, if you like. So I think that the future will be very exciting. The near future will be very exciting for designers, because there's this proximity between the design and industry that, that was never really possible before. And, and it may be that we end up a bit like the medieval high street again, where all of those disused shops um, are now used for making things to measure at short notice. So that's a, a, a future to look forward to. Um, we're going to go to, to Milan, uh, which is the, the big festival of design every year. And we've got, in fact, this is a, a total exclusive, uh, world exclusive for you guys, um, which is that this is a space that we've uh, managed to acquire with Caesarstone, um, which hasn't really been used before for, um, for, for the uh, the fair, which is a, a, a 18th, no, 17th century plague pit. There's only 200,000 bodies 
buried underneath um, this cloister here. <laughs> and then in the building above, um, we'll be doing uh, an installation with Caesar Stone. And it'd be good for you to see the, the Caesar Stone installation here, which, uh, so we've, we've debuted the, the collaboration in Toronto um, with a kitchen called Ice. But by the time it gets to Milan, Ice will fill one of these corners and there'll be three other kitchens. So four kitchens in total um, with Caesar Stone. And we'll be um, creating a total restaurant. So if ever, any of you have got the opportunity to come to Milan and see this collaboration. Um, you heard it here first. Yeah. So I'm just going to end up now with a slightly more conceptual project. I think you know every designer has to make sure they think about the future a bit. And the future might be disastrous for me. The robots take over. Nobody wants to buy my stuff anymore. And so I've got a backup plan, right? So I'm going to share with you my little backup plan, which is um, really about um, trying to create an underwater furniture farm. So um, the important thing, thing about this is that, um, yeah, what's the important thing? So what you do is you, 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 you make these metal structures and you can sink them. It has to be in hot water, OK? You can't do this in Canada, sorry. You have to do it in the Bahamas or in Indonesia, um, which is why it's a good retirement plan. But what you do is you, you sink your, your um, structures in the water and you charge them with a small amount, a small voltage of electricity um, from a solar panel. And what happens as a consequence is it, is it um, accumulates a crust of calcium carbonate, which is the same material as chalk or, or um, limestone or, or uh, the fur that you get in your kettle, at the bottom of your kettle. So um, it's also a carbon capture, um, a carbon capture um, uh, because it's calcium carbonate um, device which means that I could also so save the world as well as ensure my retirement. So you can see here crust growing on my metal frameworks, and that grows really quite quickly. Um, you get this, um, it's almost like an M&M. &M. You get this, this, these circles of, of, of growth. And this is a year and a half in. You can see the rings of growth, which are also to do with the temperature. So what's happening is that, is that something that was a five millimeter thick metal rod becomes a kind of reinforced concrete um, chair within a year or two. And so it also becomes quite a good environment for marine life. So you can see here a sponge has grown on the structure. Um, there's fish swimming underneath, um, safe from fishermen. And, and further up, corals are starting to grow as well. And it, and it becomes a device which allows coral um, to regenerate itself much faster as well. Uh, so it's a technique dreamt up by a, a 70s scientist that was uh, hoping to build whole cities like this, um, floating cities. Um, on the ocean, but it never actually happened. So I'm trying to reinvigorate that idea. And, and here you have a picture of me, almost naked for the ladies, um, which is me fishing out my first chair from my underwater chair farm. Um, and that should be available on the art market coming up quite soon. So in my dream, I'm lying on the beach. Occasionally, I pull out a chair. Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Sell stuff to tourists <laughs> um, uh, in Nassau. Yeah, so that's the plan. Um, so thanks for listening so patiently. Um. Where do you find your inspiration? <laughs> Did I not just explain that? <laughs> no, I mean, you know, I think too many designers uh, find their inspiration from other designers or design magazines or go to design fairs or, you know, for me, it's, it's really important to get out of design and, um, and to experience other things. So, you know, the experience in the restaurant is, is fascinating. So I cook in the restaurant, right, um, as a professional sous chef. Um, and that is the best way of learning how to design a restaurant, you know, from every aspect. You know, as a customer, you never really get a, an understanding of the operation of a restaurant. You know, I like, you know, I, I prefer contemporary sculpture show. You know, the Caesar Stone installation is more trying to, to think of a material as, you know, a kitchen as, as a... Um, as, as strong as a bit of minimal art rather than thinking of it as a series of boxes with functions, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So music still, you know, not an inspiration from a, a, a kind of direct relation with the music, but the music business has provided me with lots of ideas of how, um, how a, country, a company could run, which, which was an anti-furniture company, for instance. So my inspiration comes... Um, from everywhere, but often it comes just still from 
the factory or the craftsman that I meet. You know, it's often about the, the, the manufacturing technique still, as you can see. I'm just curious, um, these are mo most people here work already in the profession, but one of the things that I find interesting is um, your relationship with younger designers. You're always finding ways to sort of bring them into your uh, environment, into your studio. So uh, how does that gener uh, uh, ge generate uh, sort of creativity in your studio, the relationship I don't know. I, don't, I, I hate young designers, you know. So, <laughs> they were, no, I, I've... Um, you know, the first project I did at Habitat was trying to find the, the oldest designers I could find, right? And, and really the people um, that people were ignoring. I mean, I had a great time meeting Werner Panton, Castiglione, Sotsas, and, and, and the rest of them just before they died. And so, you know, I make no distinction between young designer, uh, non-designer, or, or, or experienced designer. Um, I, I just like um, people with original ideas, right? Um, I can't remember your question. It was just about the relate. You, you've, I've noticed, and maybe uh, that you've, you reach out to younger designers quite often. I'm seeing the mo most exhibit. Uh, you've done other sort of collaborations that way. I'm just curious if that's. Well, you know, for, for, yeah, for a long time, I, I, I powered my, my, particularly my metalwork studio with, with um, a lot of uh, cheap labour. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, we were atypical because we were actually making, we were making things. And I think a lot of people went through that studio and realized that you didn't, you know, you didn't need to be authorized, have a certificate to, to practice, and, and that you could have a direct relationship with a customer. And, you know, the modern world is, you know, is, is not about you. Or, you know, a brand isn't, isn't anymore what it used to be, which is an enclosed environment that you defend at all costs. It's really about your network, right? So, you know, anything that you do to help a young designer is going to come and help you in the long run, right? You know, all the people, what's interesting also about the people that specify our stuff, um, you see it when we go to Klaus, um, our dealer here in Canada, is that, is that the people are actually specifying the stuff. They might not have the money, but they're specifying for the people that do or the, or the, or the restaurant that, that needs it, you know. So, um, you know, you do yourself a, a great big favor by, by looking after uh, younger people. But I'm still young, okay? Yes. So just like, let's get this straight. <laughs> With all your many explorations through your life, how do you maintain drive and focus? <laughs> I've never really had any drive and focus. I just get really bored easily. And, you know, it's, uh, it's um, you, you know, if I'd had drive and focus, I'd have gone to design school and, you know, and, and had a good... Most of my, what, what I thought was a strategy has gone, you know, really... Pear-shaped. I mean, you know, I'd, I'd like to talk more about the mistakes than the um, than the, the triumphs, you know. But but what what's, what you need is elasticity, I think, in, in, in the modern world. You know, you, you need to be adaptable and and um, uh, yeah, drive. Honestly, I, I I get I get bored fast. You can see it now. I'm losing <laughs> I'm losing it right now, right? <laughs> <laughs> And focus, my God. You know, it's nice of you to say so, but I'm really not focused. I'm more chaos, like chaos theory, right? So it's like you see a pattern emerging from all the chaos, uh, the chaos that you create. So focus really isn't... I mean, it's kind of interesting that that's what you think drives me, yeah? Um, because I wouldn't describe that myself. Anyone? Alex, what do you say? No, no. <laughs> he says no focus, and he works for me. <laughs> Hi. Can you talk a little bit about your mistakes um, that you mentioned? I think you know it's really important to to um, to put yourself in situations where you you don't really know the outcome, you know. And, and some of my m most um, terrible mistakes have turned into commercial products, you know. So you know we've got this lamp called the Mirror Ball, which is a very simple um, globe, which is reflective. In my mind, I was, uh, you know, my self-imposed brief was to make an invisible lamp that would fit into every single interior by just reflecting its surroundings, right? That was my plan, like a camouflage. And it did the absolute opposite. It was so bling and stood out completely that it was a total failure from, you know, the initial idea, but it became the, the, the object that created our company. So I'm eternally grateful to that mistake. So I think, you know, what you need is the same thing as elasticity and you need to be able to, s be able to drop something when it's not, not good. I mean, the best designers, proper designers like James Dyson, you know, th that famous story of him making 200 prototypes for 
um, for, um, for his uh, vacuum cleaner is, um, is the way the designer should be, like not afraid to fail and try again and try again. You know, and that's what, you know, I've got the luxury of doing that because, you know, because uh, uh, it's my own cash. I'll never be really profitable though. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, I was just wondering, like, how do you deal with the time constraints when it comes to design? Because it's a creative process. Like, how can you kind of squeeze creativity within a time period to deliver, like, what you would want to? Well, it's the same thing. You know, the, 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 the beauty of having your own company is that, to a certain extent, you define the timelines yourself. And I think, you know, I look at fashion designers and, and the intense pressure to hit a seasonal design a, a deadline with something new two, three, four times a year and think that would be hell. Whereas for us, you know, I think the, you know, the, the, the furnishings industry should be a, a, a lot slower. It should be a calmer rate. And you should just try and produce stuff when it's ready rather than forcing it. I mean, obviously, you know, every, everything's pushing you to be on time and on deadline. We've made some terrible mi mistakes by, by trying to, to fit into a deadline. You, and you always disappoint your customer. So, so now, more and more, we're, we're trying to launch things when they're ready. Um, I think the idea of once a year in Milan is probably breaking up. I mean, you know, it's obvious that it'd probably be better to launch something in, in, in uh, Toronto. Uh, next year, rather than trying to fight with everybody in in, um, in Milan, um, and have many more points of uh, of uh, launch, um, you're a much more attentive audience than uh, the Milanese one, I'd say. A much bigger audience, and I'd be able to draw in Milan because I'd be fighting with hundreds of other brands that were shouting really loud. So I'm looking at, at, at trying to deconstruct my launches and, and launch them when I'm ready, um, probably anywhere in the world. So currently, I'm an industrial design student at Rochester, but you've convinced me that I should get out of school and drop out and make, just make stuff. So what advice- Don't tell your parents, <laughs> that was me. Okay. So what advice do you have for students to make most out of school? You know, I don't, I don't, um, I don't think I should convince, you know, everybody's individual, you know, um, and everybody has a different need in terms of um, what nurtures them. I mean, I was not, May, I was not fit to go back to college after I did high school, right? And I had a very good, um, at least a, a good pottery class in, in my high school. And um, I was ready for the real world. Maybe you're not, maybe you are. But um, even in college, you can practice doing things for real um, before you take that leap of, of, of jumping out. I don't want the responsibility, actually. <laughs> I was wondering, since you're a self-thought uh, designer, architect, and etc., what drew you towards that field to begin with? Um, I think that's interestingly enough. I, I, th I think what really ins what gave me confidence, not inspired me, was money. Right. So the very fact that somebody would buy something that I'd made kind of legitimized it in a way that was just really brilliant. Too, too few people have that direct relationship with being able to make something and then, um, and then sell it. You know, it's like, uh, like being a baker or something. You're, you're able to complete something and, and then hand it over and then make the next one. You know? So I, I, was, um, I was astonished that people would buy rusty bits of metal. And it seemed like magic to me. And like I say, it became this thing of alchemy where um, just by having an idea, um, and some raw material, you could convert it into something that people were prepared to buy. And it's still really what fascinates me today. When I, you know, I, you know, I could create lots and lots of things, and they could sit in a warehouse or, or, or be in an art gallery or something, and nobody buy them. Then it wouldn't be so motivating. So it's really, you know, the customer, um, really, that the motiv motivates me. I mean, I'm not in it really for the money. Otherwise, I'd be doing something else. But um, I, I do think that that transaction of, of somebody having faith in, in in your idea is something quite magical. Yeah. So you talked a little bit about uh, the constant eBay knockoffs. And other than the both flattering and financially uh, painful ramifications of that, what keeps you up at night? Well, okay, I don't. I sleep very well. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, I, I do get nervous about the big piles of stuff in my warehouse. You know, 
you know, as you get more successful, as you, you make more designs, I mean, we have 600 items in our selection now. You have to be a very good gambler, you know, it's like say, right, I think I can sell a couple of thousand of these, you know, a hundred of those, 10,000 of these, and then suddenly you've got all of these boxes in your warehouse and anything could happen, you know, anything can happen. A fire at the warehouse, uh, a global collapse of the economy, and so, you know, it is kind of stressful, but I try not to think about it, otherwise really I wouldn't sleep. And when you visit, you know, I've got warehouses of stuff, and I'm adding to, you know, the stuff on the planet as well, and that makes me feel bad, so I wish you wouldn't ask me those kind of questions. It's like, <laughs> I've already got jet lag. Uh. Hopefully this will be a simpler question. The house that you showed us had a blue pool and a lot of blue circles and squares and other shapes. Were they other pools or skylights or what, were, what made up those blue forms? There's a, a really skinny um, you know, pool for exercise, not for, not for fun, you know, and um, uh, which covers the entrance to the car park, there's a skylight, um, there's some solar panels, and there's some uh, ventilation. But, you know, trying to make those intrinsic to the design of the building was, was the idea. So, yeah, I like squares and circles, you may have noticed. Triangles are good, too. <laughs> Any more questions? Oh. Hi there. I'm just curious about the graphics on the screen right now and why you chose them. Because it's looking into the future, right? That's the plan. I think, you know, for a designer, it's like, you know, people always ask me, what's your favorite design that you've ever done? This is a, a typical reporter question, right? And I'm like, I don't even like, you know, I, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not nice and you shouldn't buy them, right? <laughs> but <laughs> um, I'm much more interested in, in what I'm making now. And, you know, we're working in 2017, right? That's, that's so, because the stuff takes a year and a half to develop and then you have to launch it and then you have to package it and you have to um, distribute it and, and catalog it and the rest of it. So we're in 2017 right now. So this is just a, a, an image about the future, which is purposefully vague. I'm not really sure what we're doing, but it's going to be great, kind of. It's going to be colorful, right? It's going to be, yeah, futuristic. Why, what, what do you see in there? <laughs> Uh, I see macro and micro. Okay, and great. Inspiration okay, maybe that's the top secret theme for next year. Who knows? Obviously, there's a very sort of um, tactile design build component to everything you do and the way that you approach it. Do you feel any sort of pressures from outside to include any of this kind of computerized functionality, Internet of Things sort of components to the things that you make? Or what, do you, what, what are your thoughts about that? Um, I think there's a lot of people working on it. And, and um, you know, it's, it's very investment heavy. And, um, and it, it doesn't particularly suit um, uh, the, the kind of typologies of object that we're doing now. I mean, even, you know, you have an interactive light that you can, you know, that you can um, control from your iPhone kind of thing that everybody's doing. That's going to be in the bulb, right? And to do a bulb, you need to, to do bulbs in millions of, of units and be a bulb specialist. So I, I think we'll incorporate it, but we'll be incorporating it as secondary parts. You know, it'd be kind of madness for me to set out right now on the path of, you know, creating my own circuit boards and my own system. You can see what's going on, a consolidation where, you know, effectively Apple rule, rule that world and, and they control those kind of things. So, I mean, maybe a collaboration would be great with, with somebody that's developing that kind of thing. But it's not the sort of thing that, that um, I think we'd succeed in, um, in that way. And I explained that people are increasingly, uh, are still quite conservative in, in their homes, you know. And so the bits of technology that interest me really more about low, low energy solutions, um, you know, longevity in objects and, and, and trying to work out how you can make something stylish without it being, um, you know, redundant next season kind of thing. And, um, you know, but I'm, 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 I'm very fascinated by the, the digital world and we use it a lot for manufacturing, right? So the answer is not now.
Okay. Thank you so much, Tom. That was really terrific. Thank you, everyone, for, uh, for attending. All right.